Good evening, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining us uh, on our auction masterclass. Um, this evening, it's going to be magical. You're going to enjoy it. We're going to have some fun. And we're going to go through some fundamentals about auctions to help you along your way. Um, just some housekeeping. We are streaming directly into YouTube, which I have no idea how we do it, but it's, again, something amazing. We're all in YouTube. Um, we're going to do the whole presentation start to finish. Um, we're going to get a good flow on. But remember, take notes and ask questions in the comment section, because at the end of the presentation, we're going to go back and answer all of your questions. OK, so um, sit down, relax, focus, ask your questions and enjoy the evening. Yeah, and uh, we still uh, a little bit before time, so we we'll wait until everyone joins, and then uh, afterwards we'll start. Uh, we'll start the presentation and uh, start sharing the things with you that we've got to share. And uh, yeah, that's it. So we'll are, there, are, are there any names that we recognise? Anyone that we can shout out and say hello to? Uh, well, if. Uh, People put some comments in, we'll know who's there. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, on this YouTube thing, we don't see who's uh, who's in and who isn't. So, uh, yeah, if you guys want to throw some names in, that would be good. At least we know who we're speaking to. Although we definitely do recognize some people who sign up for this. Uh, that's uh, definitely there. Brilliant. Uh, hi, Asio. How you doing, Harpit? That's good. It's good. Nice. A few more people. Natalie, Leah, Mehmet, Bailam. Nice. Good to see everyone. Um, there's it's quite quite a big uh, quite a big group of people that. Uh, We've worked with in the past that we know but also a lot of people go maybe see us the first time or maybe they know omar or maybe they know someone else but good to good to see everyone nice one okay well i i think uh it's uh it's a minute past seven so shall we get going jay start. yeah let's kick it off let's kick it off i'll start sharing the presentation Go for, it. Go for the housekeeping as well, maybe as for the people who just joined. Absolutely. So uh, welcome and thank you for joining us this evening on our Property Auctions uh, Trading Masterclass. You're here with Gott Rusnek, Jay Howard and Omer Mehmet. Um, housekeeping wise, we are streaming directly into YouTube. I have no idea how that works, but it's working. People are saying hello. Um, so we're going to run through the entire presentation start to finish. Um, I'm sure it'll be entertaining and funny at points, um, fingers crossed. Um, so make sure you put any questions that pop up in between uh, or throughout the presentation into the comments section. At the end of the presentation, we're going to come back and we're going to go through all those answers for you. Um, so just make sure you put down what's uh, in your mind at the point uh, that you have the question rather than saving all the way up to the end. Um, but yes, enjoy the evening. Nice. Sir. Okay, well, let's go for what this masterclass is about. Can we go for the day? Yes, yes. So for in this masterclass, we're going to be talking through um, tactics uh, and things that you can do to make sure that you are making profit at auction rather than overpaying, as so many people do. You do not want to be one of those people on Homes Under the Hammer or somewhere else. Um, mm -hmm. Key distinctions for the auction environment, we're going to run through those. Those are really very important. That tells you about the differences between auctions and private treaty estate agents. And some of those things can be key in your understanding to take advantage of some of the benefits to buyers and sellers auction. We are going to be going through the three types of properties that will make you the most profitable. These are deals and these are things that we've done in the past and we're going to continue to use in the future. Um, so we're going to touch on those and then we're going to go into our due diligence. Due diligence auction is completely different to the standard kind of thing that you do through an estate agent. You've got all the time in the world at auctions. It's compressed. So you have to be diligent. You have to make sure you're not skipping any steps and not forgetting to do the basics. So we're going to run through some of that this evening um, for you. Then we're going to go on to the case studies. Now, those case studies do include uh, 
among other things, some of the three types of properties that you can do the most profit in at auction. So we're going to go through some of those. Those are, those are examples that we've done personally and people within our buyers club have done and, of course, our clients have done. So there's plenty to go through there. Uh, then we're going to talk about next steps. Um, so next steps is really important. Don't forget that part. And once that's finished, we're going to go back round and answer all of your questions. It's going to be a fun evening. Nice. Uh, Brent, so a little bit about us. Uh, like I said, uh, um, and quite a lot of you might, be, uh, might know us, might listen to our Sunday special uh, Facebook Lives or listen to our Facebook Lives last year that was streaming of them every day for like three months. Uh, and uh, but maybe you know Omar, but you don't know us. And so uh, maybe some people know us, but don't know Omar. Uh, so uh, we'll just uh, introduce ourselves and uh, we will uh, tell you why we think we're quite qualified to talk about what we're talking about tonight. So uh, brilliant. Myself, Piotr Sinek, uh, I've been a trader for 10 years. I've been uh, working for clients a lot, uh, helping them buy properties and auctions. And so uh, mostly right now, um, uh, we're focusing on selling properties in auctions for clients. And uh, Hammered Auctions is our auction consultancy where we help people maximize the sale of their property at auction. Um, I have been, uh, as I, like I said, uh, trading properties for about 10 years. Uh, and that includes uh, a lot of deals that actually I did with uh, Omar and Jay as well in the auctions. Um, we love the book Before the Hammer Falls, uh, which has been a number one bestseller on Amazon. And uh, we run workshops as well about auctions. And one of our uh, workshops uh, two years ago was attended by Omar. And then we started working much closer with Omar uh, over the last couple of years and we've done some amazing things. But I'll let you, uh, Omar, introduce yourself and take it from there. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> apologies, I've got a bit of a croaky throat at the moment, but um, I'm Omer Mehmet, um, aka Ohms Under the Hammer, if anyone follows me on Instagram. Um, I uh, more recently have added the title of auction trader to um, my name. Um, I've been trading at auction now for a couple of years, but predominantly my main uh, business is, is a, a mortgage broker is called Trinity Finance. Um, I've been a mortgage broker myself for the last 12 years and I run a brokerage um, which helps um, all our clients arrange various types of finance from standard buy to lets to um, development, commercial, bridging um, and a particular area that we focus on helping customers with is um, rapid auction finance which is particularly complex. Um, alongside that I also run a construction company um, where I project manage my own um, refurbs, flips, HMOs and all the rest of that type of stuff. So um, yeah, I met JMP up two years ago on their workshop um, and ever since then I've been trading at auction um, without blowing my own trumpet. In 2021 I made 250000 from um, exchange delay completion back-to-back -back sales at auction. That's literally buying properties and selling them at auction. Um, which we'll show you some of those case studies a little bit later on if that excites uh, some of the people on the webinar today. Nice one, Jay. I know about those deals and I still get excited. So for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Jay Howard. I'm the former auction manager at Auction House London. I was there for six years. So for six years, every single property across my desk, every single purchase, every single sale, everything I dealt with. So the experience I have there is vast. I've been trading properties uh, in and out of auction since 2002, uh, February more specifically. So I'm almost at 20 years. Um, I am the co-author before the Hammer Falls, as Piot mentions, and I'm also co-director of Hammered Auctions uh, and the things that we do there. Um, we've got some of our clients on online this evening. Um, so we don't really need to say much there, but it's, it's, it's great stuff. Um, so that's us. Nice one, brilliant. Okay, well, that's uh, that's introductions done. Uh, you guys uh, kind of have a better idea of who we are. Let's go into the the meat of the the the, the whole masterclass, 
uh, Jay, you want to start with these key distinctions? Yes, yes. So key distinctions of the auction market. So this is where you get the differences from off-market, estate agency, investment agency, whatever it may be. This is what makes the auctions what they are. This is why auctions are special. So the first um, set of distinctions are around the seller. Most people who sell at auction are motivated in one way, shape or form to sell. And now that may, it's normally they have a time restriction to sell. Um, time restrictions such as they're about to be repossessed or they're about to go into bankruptcy and they're trying to sell to stave off some kind of impending action. That tends to be the majority of it. And once you go out of that personal state, you then enter into the realms of corporate sellers. So corporate sellers are like um, the re banks doing repossessions by, by order of uh, mortgages in possession is what you'll normally see on the auction catalog. You'll also see executor sales. Um, on the catalogue. Um, those are people that have passed away um, and have to sell because they're trying to complete an estate. And one of the reasons they sell at auction is because it is classified as an at arm's length transaction and it is sold in an unbiased, open, unfettered environment. And that's something very, very important. It's actually why a lot of corporate sellers sell. Um, you also have traders that sell at auction um, like ourselves and there are others, of course. Um, and their main motivation to sell is that they've taken an asset, um, they bought it at a fixed price, and then they're just trying to turn a quick profit. So what they tend to do is they bring properties that normally wouldn't come to market, they secure them, they bring them to market, and they go around again. It's a very simple process once you understand it. Um, and their trick really is to get the money moving consistently, moving, moving, and moving. And we're going to give an example of how we did one of those this year. Oh, sorry last year um we're so close to this year um last year um and made a tidy profit on that one the benefits to the seller in these situations with the advice of the auctioneers is that they will be setting the reserve of the property now that reserve is unknown to the members of the public yourselves as bidders um and that reserve is designed to be um at a below market value or co comparatively compared to local um comparables below the market value. Um, you will find, generally speaking, that could be anywhere between 10 to 30% below market value, depending on the area, the asset, and the issues affecting the property. Yeah. Um, the other thing that uh, sellers get to do is they set the terms of the sale. Now, they do that um, by providing a legal pack. Um, now, legal packs are tricky things. We're not going to go into mad detail about that this evening because you will all fall asleep. But uh, we will be going into further detail on that um, at a separate time and place. Um, so they set the terms of sale, normally in the special conditions or the contract. Um, and when we talk about those things and we talk about the legal pack, the first property, the first document you go to is the special conditions of sale. That will tell you everything that you need to know at a glance. So those are the key distinctions for the seller as compared to um, off market or private treating. Um. Key distinctions for buyers. Um, there are quite a few key distinctions here. So um, you, it is incumbent upon you to review the terms of the sale. That's your first step. Normally, when you're dealing with estate agents, you get to do the whole romancing, go and, go and view it five or six times, take the family round, get a measured survey, do a whole bunch of crazy stuff that you you know you have you have the capacity to do in those situations. You get to set the terms, you get to decide when you're exchanging, decide when you're completing. It all gets to be happy and lovely until it all goes wrong, of course, and people fall out or you get gazumped or gazunded or whatever the situation is. But in this situation, it is incumbent upon the buyer to review the terms of the sale. That's not just restricted to the legal pack. Make sure you read the auctioneer's common auction conditions to make sure you know what it is, the, the, the field of battle that you're in. Um, buyers, this is something I talk about all the time. So put the value on the property given those terms in the legal pack and uh, the content on their own perceptions. So it, in essence, it basically means whatever price is in the catalog, you can just wipe your ass with it. It means absolutely nothing. So what you want to be doing is you want to be saying, right, what would I pay for this? What makes sense? What stacks for me? Remember, a price anywhere in property, estate agency or otherwise, is just someone's imagination. Yeah, it's just because a rick surveyor went out and valued it doesn't mean you're willing to pay that yeah so just make sure that you are really focusing on that that's got to be your key okay um bid up uh, 
And the final thing for buyers as a main distinction is bidding against others who come up with their own values. Now, the way that we combat this is what we do is when we look at the asset, we think, what what, what other investor would be attracted to this asset? So if we're looking at a semi-detached or a detached property that isn't in an Article 4 area and we're thinking, right, we'll just do a little extension, we'll tart it up and we'll flip it on. We're going to be up against every single HMO investor within the 15 mile radius and they can pay more than we can as a BRRR in type investor type of person. An HMO investor can pay more because yield compression, they're going to get more. It's going to yield up. It's going to finance better. So once you understand who your competition are, you can then value the property in their eyes. And it's a really quick and simple way to distinguish which properties you can spend time on because you know that you're the best person to buy the property or pay the most value um, and get the most out of it. Or the ones you can just disregard really very quickly. You don't have to waste time on. You don't have to deal with the disappointment of not securing the asset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So very, very uh, key um, considerations there for you. Very interesting distinctions. Ah, so here we go. The key. The, this is the auction environment. A lot of people say to me, "I want to. I want to secure this asset before the auction." And I always say to them, "Why do you want to buy it before the auction?" The amount of times we have had someone buy a property pre-auction, and we know that they have paid way more than what it was going to go for in the room. Way more. The impatience of wanting, or, or, or it's either impatience or it's fear. It depends on on who you're talking to. They're either afraid they're not going to get it in the room, so they really they run up to it, they blow their load very early, and they pay massively over the odds for the asset. But they secure it, and they feel happy until they get the bidder's remorse, um, or uh, it's fear. You know, so it's one of those two. But you can negotiate terms. So times when we've seen this work is um, they put an offer on a short lease flat. Um, it's being sold by an executor um, and there isn't a section 42. So the buyer is saying, I will pay X for it as long as you serve the section 42, assign the benefit to me so I don't have to wait for two years. That's mm -hmm. something where you're creating a win-win style situation without coming across too plebe. Um, those are kind of situations that work. Just flying off the handle to secure the asset pre-auction, never a good idea. You need to be finding a way to negotiate additional value for yourself where that's saying, oh, instead of completing in 28 days, we'd like to complete in six weeks. You know, those are the kind of things that you can negotiate on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ideally, what you want to be doing is you want to be a vulture. You want to be the person at the end of the auction looking for the carcass with the most meat on it. Yeah. You want to be looking for the thing that's got the most money hidden in there. It's under all the other dead bodies that they've left behind. You've got to really dive deep and look for the deal. But the deal is there. There's always one golden opportunity. There's a diamond in the rough at the end of every auction. Someone just hasn't seen where the value is. You want to be that guy or girl or nondescript person of some description. You want to be that individual that gets that deal. So sometimes you can jump in afterwards. And the thing we're going in after the auction is that the vendor's expectations are already being handled. Mm. It hasn't sold in the room. They're disappointed. They're still mm. motivated. Now, they may not move too heavily on price, but will they do a subject two? Maybe. You'll still need to exchange and do all that stuff. But uh, will they give you a longer completion point? Will they sign a statutory declaration for X, Y, and Z? Will they do the searches if they're missing? Will they give you the management pack if it's missing? Those are the kind of conversations you can create post-auction that you may not always have the opportunity to do pre-auction. So that's a real key distinction for the auction environment. There are certain ways that you can gain the system if you have the patience, the perseverance, and the balls, really. <laughs> Of some sort. Of some sort, yeah, I'm not judging. <laughs> uh, brilliant. Okay, well, we're, we're going to cover now the three types of properties that will make most money in the auction. So, uh, Omar, you want to take it off? Yeah, sure. Okay. <clears throat> so, we could probably do 10 types of properties that you'll make money, but the three that we, we really um, like and have got direct experience with as well, um, the first one would be commercial properties that have uh, development potential. And these are often missed by your standard residential buyer who's looking at your Savills and your all sops where there may not be a huge amount of commercial property listed for sale. So we're looking for properties which um, can be repurposed to residential, um, properties where potentially there is a permitted development right to allow you to do that quickly, perhaps under the 56 day prior notification, or 
um, potentially something that just has that ability to massively uplift the price per square footage from moving it from a, a, a low value class like commercial into that residential class. So that's generally what we're looking for, um, the development angle, um, and you do come across them. This particular uh, image that you can see here is one of our case studies that we're going to discuss at the end of the webinar. Um, so I won't talk too much about that now, but what I will say just briefly is that one of the things we do when looking for commercial property with development is trying to find misplaced uh, properties, perhaps in the wrong auction or with uh, a bad or m misinformed description where we can undiscover something and add potential value that another buyer may not see. So um, yeah, that's, that's point one, um, the first property that you can try and make some money on. Number two, um, one of my favorites. Most special. This is my favorite, actually. It's something that I, I, I actively um, look for on a daily base, basis is title splitting opportunities. So um, you can find them in residential and commercial. I tend to find this a lot more in residential. So we're looking for corner plots. We're looking for houses with large uh, pieces of land to the rear, um, to the side that have potential access where splitting that title. And in, in, in this example with this image here where the garage is, um, there is potential to um, split that title and that garage could be sold off um, and, and at a premium whilst the house is then retained or also sold off at auction. So, um, and again, this is a case study, so I won't go into a huge amount of detail on it just now because we are going to cover it at the end. Um, and we didn't actually title split this particular one, which we'll explain, but, but this is a perfect example of, of where you can locate a title split opportunity. That's right. And I think that the reason why we said those three types of properties is to uh, make sure that uh, like like as going through auction catalogs, there is a kind of a point of reference, point of focus. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easier to spot the, the actual mm -hmm. opportunities because sometimes it's really difficult to go through yeah. hundred properties in the catalog, not yeah. knowing exactly what you might be looking for. Uh, mm -hmm. But those, uh, those three types of properties are probably the kind of like uh, the, the kind of things that should switch on the light saying oh, there might be an opportunity there, there might be some profits to be made there. Mm. Um, so yeah, well said. Absolutely, yeah. And then the final one, which I think probably is um, Jay and Piot's favourite, are the kind of paper exercise type opportunities whereby something is missed from the description or not in the special, uh, in the legal pack or perhaps there's you know just something that you can kind of sort out pretty easily but it just kind of puts off a lot of buyers so in this particular example the image there is a commercial property and, and when it went for sale in auction um there were no details of the tenancy agreement so no reference to who was renting the shop and the lease and no reference to any potential ast on the upper so that can create quite a lot of fear to any incoming buyer but um, for the savvy, sophisticated investor that can do their due diligence, you, you can pretty much work all this stuff out if, if you know what you're doing. So, again, um, paperwork. Um, I'm happy to get my hands dirty with the construction company. JMP prefer to do some paperwork exercises and, and make money that way. So this is a, also a great opportunity. That's right. And, and I, I call those type of things, like you just need to become like a detective, basically, to start going through things and uh, finding the bits of information that other people have missed. And remember there was one type of property and I keep sharing this for the last nine years because it was in 2011. And there was this property in Maidavelle, which was a freehold block of flat split into five flats and it was sold off the same as this property without tenancy agreements in the auction. And was five flats sold with a guide price of offered with a guide price of 1.1 million or 1 million something like this basically my boss uh, what he did because there were no tenancies there were risks that those flats could be on reg registered tenancies and i remember he just went over to those tenants and uh, knocked on the doors and got all like confirmed that all those five tenancies are ast so it's 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 all fairly standard stuff and uh, basically purchased the property for 1.1 million and once he knew that those are asts he got them from the tenants and he sold off this property two weeks later for 1.3 million it was absolutely insane but those kind of pieces of information uh, are critical because 
lack of it makes a problem to someone. But if you have that piece and if, you, if it's only you have got that piece, then you can solve that problem. So if there's a problem with the property, it's a problem not only for you, but also for all the other people. And that means there will be no competition. And if there's no competition, um, you, you are free to get your information and buy the property. So that's, uh, that's, that's the third type of property. Um, yeah. And uh, brilliant. Well, like, let's, let's talk a little bit about due diligence and uh, sort of how to, um, how to save you countless hours and, and, and a lot of money. Uh, I know we've got, uh, we've got uh, some people here who are uh, like uh, reviewing legal parks and, and, and uh, uh, in the legal profession. Um, but I think what we all need to become is a bit like uh, kind of unofficial solicitors, basically. So we need to learn how to uh, do diligence quickly before the solicitors really get into it so that we only refer things to solicitors that are worth, uh, worthwhile uh, their time and we know uh, the red flags before they tell us so that we can save money. And one of the ways of avoiding those red flags, and that's the kind of, that's the number one thing is uh, always checking street history on, uh, on uh, EIG. So EIG is uh, the portal which lists all of the auction uh, properties uh, that are coming up. And, um, and basically it's like right move and land registry for, for auction properties. It kind of, you can see information that that's uh, a historical and, and, and also current. And those historical information go up to like, I think 1992 or something like that, quite a long way. And uh, basically uh, what I do, and I'll share the screen with you guys. I think you can see this. Uh, this, is, this is one of the auction catalogs that's uh, currently live and that's a Harman Healy catalog. And uh, basically, when I was going for this catalog, I was just looking for some properties. And literally, the first property that is here, you look at this one, flat five, Clarendon Road. Is it a good property? Is it not a good property? Is it worthwhile investigating? Is it not worthwhile investigating? Would you pay 120000 for it? Who knows? But if you look into that, if, if you look into, into the uh, auction, the street history of it, you will see that within like five seconds, you see that this property was offered already three times in the last three months or two months really. And it went unsold once with Barnard Marcus. It was available at 105. It went unsold twice. It was available then at 95. And now it's offered with a guide price of 90K and probably a reserve around that level. So offering 120K for this property would be probably crazy. So you know already there's a point of reference unless you unless this property works at 90 95k there's no point even doing more due diligence there's no point sending this to a solicitor there's no point um, going to portsmouth and uh, looking at this and uh, seeing what you might do unless you know at 90k you are about that so um, another this... red flag there Pio, is if you scroll down a little bit flat four was also in the auction so you, it kind of brings out to question, what is non-standard about this building that is making people go through the auction route instead of going the traditional route? So there may be something hidden in, in that that you'd want to you'd want to address. That's right. And, and, and also, like, I think uh, going through the due diligence like this, uh, looking through historical data really expands what uh, what you consider a deal because you might be seeing some properties and I do that, uh, like I, it happens to me a lot of the time where I look at some pro, like some comparables for clients or something like that. And then I see a property being offered once for, let's say there was one property I remember being offered in Stafford sale for 75 K and it sold, it was vacant commercial. And then three months later it was offered and sold for 150 K. And, and I was, and I was looking like, what is the difference between those two? And what I saw was that uh, basically someone uh, just tenanted the property and put it on with a different auction. And that's how simple uh, you can uh, basically utilize this to learn 
what other people are doing to profit from auctions and uh, i find it fascinating now not surprisingly <laughs> uh, but that's basically uh that's that that's the number one thing so eig is a portal which uh, is a subscription portal uh, you need to basically uh, pay, I think it's about 300 pounds plus VAT or 250 pounds plus VAT for six months. Uh, but it's an essential thing. Like it's absolutely essential when it comes to auctions uh, because we know how much money you actually need to spend when, uh, when, when, when you're buying properties in auctions. So we're not here to tell everyone that, oh, you can buy things with no money down. You can uh, make millions of pounds worth just putting down one pound on the table. No, it's like auctions take up the resources and you need some money and you need some financial resources to uh, profit from things. But then there are some clever ways of doing things that perhaps might allow you not to use as much money as you would normally need, but you still need access to things and to access to resources. Um, and uh, yeah, we're going to share with you a bit more about this website as well uh, at the end uh, well, like when we're answering the questions. Just to briefly add to that in regards to EIG as well, um, one of the things that I do with my EIG subscription is I, I have alerts set up in certain areas. So um, if you've got lots of time, you can trail um, all the different auction websites and you, you can trail the, the right moves and the zooplas and, and look for your properties. But with EIG, as soon as the property is listed in your area, you can set certain criteria and, and then you'll get an email which gives you the list of those properties. And, it, and it's um, updated very frequently, which is really handy so that you're not spending ages um, looking for stuff that's in the wrong area. So that's pretty handy. Yeah, definitely. 100%. It is uh, my home screen, just an FYI. When I open up the <laughs> internet browser, uh, I log instantly into, I just want to see what properties are like, what's new, what's going on. Um, uh, you don't have to be that fanatical, but uh, just, just highlight actually how important it is if you're going to make a success out of auctions. Yeah. And also, I mean, you've just highlighted Harmon Healy. It's a relatively small auction house. Not that many people know about it, but some people do. But that's the other benefit of EIG is it's going to expose all of these auction houses, whether they're <clears throat> the big ones or the small ones that you, you may not know about. So I think it's, yeah. it's, a, it's an, if you're, if you're going to be active in auctions, it's, it's a must. Um, it's, yeah. 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 Uh, brilliant. Okay. So EIG, that's, uh, that's one thing. And then the second, the most simple thing ever, but very often skipped, uh, that reveals a lot of information is just literally Googling the address. And what mm -hmm. I mean by that is type in the address. If you're looking at that property uh, in South Sea in Portsmouth, just type in no, flat five, whatever, whatever name of the road and uh, South Sea and the postcode. And you will be surprised how many things come up. Um, or sometimes like you will find things that are historical that uh, are of an, like massive use for you right now because maybe you will find that the property was advertised for rent some time ago maybe you will find some uh, floor plans from the past um, and like google reveals a lot of information especially if you type in the the, the full address of the property so uh, very underrated uh, but extremely valuable most uh, people just go to right move or something like that put in the postcode look for sales comparables or look for rental comparables Google the whole address. It will change your life. The things that you will see, um, it's not to be skipped. It's like the easiest mm. thing. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. And uh, the number three thing, which is uh, very much free, although you can sometimes be generous and offer people wine, money, things, uh, other things. Oh, I'm worried about what he's going to put up next. <laughs> And these are not two people kissing. These are yeah. two <laughs> so basically speaking with auctioneers, local agents, neighbors, like basically anyone you can think of and might know a piece of information about the property you're interested in, because mm -hmm. in this time pressured environment, every piece of information might be critical. And um, again, when you're speaking with auctioneer, think the key things are auctioneers are super busy they sometimes may appear like they do not care 
uh, but they might get uh, 100 phone calls about the same property asking them the same question. So they're, they're out to, they've got some automatic answers. They will say, like, find out in the legal park, like, um, ask solicitors. Like, basically, they, they will say things like that just to kind of direct their, their attention, their, their energy away from them. But uh, really what uh, the way you should be speaking with uh, auctioneers is in a committed way. So uh, if you try to find out uh, if the seller is going to accept pre-auction offers, make a pre-auction offer. Say to auctioneer, don't ask them, uh, would the seller accept a pre-auction offer? No, come in and say, I want to make an offer, £150,000 for this property before the auction. Please pass this on to the seller. And that way you will find out if the auction, if the seller is accepting offers or not. And uh, sometimes, uh, yeah, those conversations with auctioneers, if the auctioneer knows that you're a committed person, you're capable and you can perform, then they will tell you a lot more things than um, many other people. Uh, local agents, uh, a lot of the times, sellers go to an auction after the properties failed to sell for an agent uh, in, in the local area so local agents will know a lot about properties that maybe they didn't even list it but they saw those properties uh, listed with other agents uh, they had the gossip in the coffee shop there will be a lot of things that uh, local or estate agents can 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 tell you about certain properties and also they will know about buildings what problems they might be and in general it's a good practice to speak with uh, agents in the area and finally neighbors neighbors will know so much uh, like even in london uh, people think that in london neighbors don't care about who lives next to them but neighbors are affected by the same things that other people in the building might be affected by and they know who own the building they know a lot of things so it's a it's a very uh, again underrated source of information and sometimes you just need to make an effort and send uh, either go go to the property yourself or send someone like a viewer or um, and ask them to basically speak to some people um is a member a member from our, our buyers club went to view a big plot of land recently um, that had failed to sell at auction once, uh, 180 mm -hmm. grand. They relisted into auction, 80,000 pounds, less 100,000 pounds. Sparked a bit of interest, thought, I'm going to go down. It's not too far of a drive from somewhere in Hertfordshire. Drove down, had a look at the land. Thought, okay, this doesn't look too bad. Um, there's some houses running around the side of it with some allotments. Thought, let me knock on a couple of neighbours' doors, following the advice that we'd given. And what he'd heard from the neighbours was auto he came back to us this was literally yesterday he came back and he said oh the neighbor said this this and this and we said well it sounds like the neighbor is just trying to deter you maybe mm -hmm. the neighbors want to buy the land they've got an ulterior motive to give me that information so it's all about like really fixating on uh, who's going to gain from whatever whatever you're being told what what the seller's going to tell you what the solicitor's going to tell you what the auctioneer's going to tell you what the neighbors are going to tell you the best way to speak to local agents is to say, look, I'm going to buy this. I'm going to tart it up. I'm going to sell it. I'm going to give you the business. All of a sudden, all of the BS that they normally give you disappears because in their back of their minds, like instruction, instruction, instruction. Yeah. So it's about like Piot says, be um, committed in the way that you speak to them and the results will follow. That's right. Yes. So that's uh, that's basically the due diligence. But it's like so much more that we could be telling about this, like, uh, we could go on about this for until midnight minimum. Uh, we uh, didn't. We didn't do the legal pack for obvious reasons because uh, no one wants to sit here in online one evening for 12, 12 hours while we talk about how to read a, a, an environmental search. It's, right, that's suicide. Too early, too, early to, too early to go to sleep. It's too early to go to sleep. So, um, like I said, we, we 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 have other things available to to talk about to talk about those details in more depth. But these are very very easy first steps that you can take um, to, to really bring your due diligence up to another level um, and, and give you clarity and focus moving forward when, when you're looking at properties at auction. Brilliant, okay, cool. Next uh, next thing, uh, the case studies. So uh, here are the things that we want to share with you and to kind of uh, highlight uh, the things that we did and uh, um, kind of give you a bit of a, um,
like principles it's not about the deals uh per se like it's not about this exact deal or the next deal the next deal it's all about the principles behind those deals and how those deals happened uh because we had no idea that those deals are gonna happen it's it's like in in auctions things just come up and you have to like process information quickly and then try to deal with things that come up your way um so 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 the reason we're saying those case studies is just to highlight the principles behind those and uh, then the results are the results uh, sometimes they're going to be better sometimes they're going to be uh, slightly lower but uh, if you follow the principles the profits are gonna are gonna follow too so uh, this is the first example of this property and we said that properties with commercial kind of uh, elements that's got residential potential are their thing to go for actually we bought this property with 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 from uh, it was actually from Harman Healy auction and was so badly marketed this is a very nice picture that actually shows you what the property is when we were looking at this in the auction catalog the only pictures available were literally f pictures of the door of the property and it was uh, absolutely like insane to kind of uh, imagine what this property could be because like we didn't have a full proper picture um, and also another thing uh, was that those units uh, had uh, very short leases so they were let on commercial leases but those all those leases were running out uh, within 12 months and basically uh, this is very unpopular for commercial investors commercial investors want something where there's a minimum five years on the lease because otherwise they can't finance it and uh, it's uh, they, they just want to be making uh, making sort of passive income from those properties and this properties was also not too much into the remit of developers because even though I had some potential to develop it had commercial tenants and sometimes developers are a little bit uh, put off by the fact that they have to deal with commercial tenants and those leases. And uh, we managed to pick this property up for £212,000. It was guided at 160 plus. It was producing 14500 just over £14,500. And uh, when we bought this property, we had an idea of doing a residential conversion of it. But we also knew that those units, so you can see that uh, this is the this is the kind of uh, all the way here is what we bought. And then the second dormer is unit number five, which wasn't included in the sale. And actually that unit was uh, uh, the owner of that unit tried to apply for the same thing that we tried, we thought we want to do which is their permitted development to for residential conversion. And he got refused four times for, for that thing. So we had to kind of uh, think whether we would be able to get our planning permission for this thing. Uh, and we had to kind of assume that possibly it might be the case that we get will get refused as well. And in that case, we had the kind of uh, plan B and plan C for this property which was basically to relet it as a commercial something else to on long-term leases and we thought maybe yoga studio maybe some workshops for something else and basically uh, that that was the plan that was the plan b um and we spent about twelve thousand pounds on additional cost and that included planning application that included uh finance costs include stamp duty literally include everything and we received nine thousand pounds of rents throughout the time we hold on to this property so really our total cost net cost were about three thousand um, pounds and what we did with this property is within eight months we sold it for six hundred and fifty thousand pounds with this uh, nice cgi and nothing else so basically this is the this is the thing the CGIs are the thing that uh, produces the most profits in auctions now. Uh, and that's kind of what we see. Uh, obviously, we got the planning permission for it. We managed to get the permitted development for four muse houses. And once we got that, uh, we created the CGIs 
We put it on with a different auction year, um, and basically we made 430,000 profit, 1,000 pounds profit in, in eight months without doing anything, without even putting that much money into into the, this whole thing. So th that's, that's a case study. But I think the key things to understand is that there will be obstacles in, in with auction properties. And when those obstacles uh, kind of appear, they appear for everyone. It's, it's kind of like, or maybe sometimes they don't, because if people don't do the research about the development, maybe they wouldn't know that unit number five got refused four times and they would be kind of um, blissfully ignorant of the whole situation. But we did the research, we knew kind of the, what, what was going to happen, but instead of that putting us off, it kind of focused us on what we would need to do in order to get permitted development. And uh, one of those things was that uh, unit five was a bit too far away from the road. One of the refusal, um, this refusal reasons was it was too far from the road to basically carry the refuse and, and, and it didn't have enough refuse and storage. Um, so what we did in our unit, we put refuse and storage in here for all four houses. So basically that meant uh, the council could, uh, could basically kick off that, that bit. And also we had cycle storage here as well instead of the houses. So uh, it all, and ticked off the boxes and we got the, uh, the planning permission. So that's the case study number one. On, on, oh on that one, Pio, the, the, the one thing I'll just add to that as well, which is something I've more recently started to look at is um, just because a planning application has failed or been rejected doesn't mean that there isn't an opportunity there. And that was clearly what Jay and Pio did here was that they, they have some I would say they've got advanced knowledge of the planning system and permitted development rights, but they also took advice from a planning consultant and an architect, and they went to, to detail to look at the refused planning applications, which basically gave a, an answer as to how to, um, the refusals painted the picture on how that they would then get an, an acceptance. So, um, but a lot of people would be completely put off by that. You know, if they would see the planning history for plan, planning applications and they, they wouldn't even entertain looking. So. So yeah, well done to you guys. Um, so this this next case study here, Clinton Avenue, um, <clears throat> this was actually a property that the three of us um, traded at auction together. It was a joint venture. Um, the property was <clears throat> initially sent to me via a local estate agent who knew that it had some uh, <clears throat> development potential um, to either build uh, another residential dwelling at, at where the garage is, or potentially to build a lot, <coughs> excuse me, a large extension. Um, it had potential to convert to HMO, split into flats. There's all sorts of things that people may have um, been keen to do with the property. So um, we secured the property uh, for 355,000. And one of the things that we, we tried to do is position ourselves <clears throat> as being a serious buyer. We evidenced the cash to be able to buy the property quickly and that we, we had a solicitor that was you know, extremely fast that could um, either use searches on an expediated basis or potentially using indemnity insurance to just make that exchange happen much more quickly than, than your typical buyer would do so. So, so it exchanged very fast and by doing so gave the seller um, the assurity that they needed um, to, to know that a buyer is locked in <clears throat> in case there's a change in the market and all those sorts of things. Um, and then allowed us to complete at a later date, which gave time to then make a decision on what we want to do with the property, whether that was to pursue a planning application and to build the scheme out <clears throat> or to um, pass it on to somebody else. So 355,000 was the purchase price. We decided that the margins were right for us and that we would <clears throat> sell the property at auction. So, so we created, we submitted some planning application, uh, a planning application for a large uh, double story side extension, part single story, part double story, rear extension, massively enhancing the size of the property. <clears throat> and then um, created some CGIs and put it in the auction house that we've, we, we felt um, suited the property best. Um, twisted some arms with the auctioneer to make sure that they gave us a really good lot number so that it would be very attractive to any potential buyers. And, and then we um, 
took a real gamble. We, 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 we listed it with a very low guide price to entice as much interest as possible in the hope that it would get into a bit of a bidding war and the property would sell for, for a large premium. So, so we exchanged, we transferred 10% to the solicitor, that's 35 and a half thousand. And then uh, it went straight into auction as a back-to-back -back sale, listed in, in the auction six weeks later, it completed and it sold for 412,000. So we claimed, um, th this will be stuff that we go into a lot more detail in terms of the people that join the auction buyers club and take further training. But we we basically um, claimed stamp duty, stamp duty sub sale relief, where we, we, we didn't pay stamp duty. There was very small frictional costs, just simply the costs of planning and CGI. And made a very large profit in a very short space of time and that's one of the things that um, i really love about auction trading is that if you can get the velocity of trading and the, the volume of trades through um, you don't need to hold properties for a very long time and have all those financing costs you can make very quick profits so so this is one that um, that we did um, and went really well so yeah nice one Cool. And the final one, this one. Jay, you want to take it over? Why you need to unmute? I am on mute. I always make that mistake. I'm terrible at that. Um, but this one, we have to be intentionally vague. So I'm just going to kick it off straight away by saying this is going to be vague. The reason this is vague is this is very, 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 very fresh. Um, and the auctioneer and the underwriter want to keep things... Um, you know, kind of confidential. Uh, confidential. But we've been given uh, the ability to share some basic details about it. And really, it's the principle that we're going to focus on here. So we're going to be talking about underwriting. And if you've read the book before The Hammer Falls, this is the bonus chapter. This is bonus chapter number one. If you haven't read the book, shame on you. You should read the book. Start with the bonus chapters. That'll help you fly through the rest of the book without any problems. Underwriting. Underwriting is where a price is agreed prior to the auction. The property continues through to the auction. And if it sells above the underwritten price, the profits are split either equally or between the buyer and seller um, or the underwriter and the seller in, in, in differing amounts. Um, so in this situation, uh, we had a property where there were two ground floor shops side by side with a very large flat above. You're now seeing picture to the rear on the screen. Um, and it's that whole building from basically that stairwell with that right um, backage and, and the dark brick kind of jutting out from, from the rear. So it's a substantial chunk of, of building. Um, it was producing £34,000 per annum. It was guided approximately at 375. We've kind of changed a couple of these figures to keep the deal hidden for any of those detectives that are going to try and find it. You probably will, but we, we've done our best <laughs> to hide parts of it. Um, we uh, are a member of our auction buyers club actually had underwritten this property at uh, approximately 480,000 pounds. The end sales price was actually a little bit higher than uh, 575, but it was in that region, um, which meant that the underwriter, so uh, a member of our club, uh, managed to walk away with 40,000 pounds profit. Only all they had to do was put down a 10% deposit to do that. So, so this is why we're saying this isn't a, uh, a purchase lease option this isn't a rent to rent this isn't a deal sourcing thing this isn't a no money down these are real deals this requires real money this requires real skill to do um like and i the, said there the, are ways the, to yeah and the, key thing, the key thing about this property was that uh, uh this person from auction buyers club he actually wanted genuinely mm -hmm. to buy this property yeah. Uh, like uh, he was like i want to buy this i want to have an income producing property and this got potential and um and and he said uh, he had quite a healthy budget for it because that five hundred eighty thousand pounds was what was he was willing to pay for it so basically i said to him i doubt you're gonna get this for this money uh, but it's healthily enough above the guide price that it's worthwhile uh offering the underwrite because then the underwrite means uh even if you don't get the property if someone outbids you because basically that 480 becomes that the reserve price it becomes like the highest bid but if someone bids higher than that you lose the property and without the underwrite it's gone and you get nothing but with the underwrite uh you still get the the parts of the profits so basically that was the key thing it was genuine it's it's for people who genuinely buy the property yeah 
that's this, that's rule one of auctions in the book uh, underwriting uh, at auctions in the book rule one is don't gamble it has to be a property that you're willing to pay for at that price the other thing is if there's the buyer at auction who failed maybe they completed but if they don't complete at that 575 number the sale reverts back to you at your underwritten price so it is a win-win if you want to buy the asset you'll either get the asset or you'll get the uplift capital uplift it's 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 twofold and the scenario for the seller here is they get that certainty like it's beyond certain you know they maybe their reserve on a property at 375 is going to be 400,000 so you've now gone you know 480 is massively above that so they're going to be comfortable and they know that if it sells for above that they're going to still be getting 50 40 60 percent of that whatever the agreement is um so it works for all of the parties and they know if the person who pays silly silly nine hundred thousand pounds for it they fail to complete they have the guarantor to four four eighty to fall back on so that's a phenomenal deal so the three principles that we've talked about here really is the first one is having multiple exits uh, and and understanding that you know just because something's failed for someone else doesn't mean it will fail for you uh, the second principle is um ha again multiple exits but having a keen eye for knowing what is possible uh, and on something like this it's about if you if you are committed and you're going to take that committed action when you're making an offer do so powerfully and that's what got uh, uh our guy the 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 underwrite in this instance just before christmas as well <laughs> just not too bad indeed yes um brilliant cool um Omar, do you want to take yeah. talk about this sure so um i thought it would be good for me to speak about this because um I, i've known jmp a little while now but they've they've put together this book um called before the hammer falls and i'm sure many of the listeners may have already um bought the book and perhaps read the whole thing um I use it regularly still now to refer to certain things if I'm um, looking to just refresh my knowledge. Um, and it's, it's, it's on my desk and it's fully it got highlighted, pen marks and notes and scribbles all over it. But the, the book took them quite a long time to put together. And the idea is that it sets out the principles for how to um, make money in auctions, but also how to not lose money in auctions and, and not to be one of those people that massively overpays and to understand the principles so so there's a huge context in there about financing there's there's also um problem properties and things to look out for like japanese not and all this sort of stuff so um i find it extremely useful um i don't think there's anything else like it on the market and i, I think if it's something that you're interested in it's a great read i keep pushing them to do an audio book because I, I like to listen to audio but they they refuse i'm not sure if it's because <clears throat> piot doesn't want to record this book is, with his Polish accent. It is in the pipeline and my Polish uh, accent is not coming away. <laughs> <laughs> but if you are starting off January 2022 with perhaps a little, um, you know, um, um, plan to do some more reading, this is a great one. So um, it's on Amazon and you could just Google before the hammer falls and, and, and you'll enjoy it, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. It, it is it is on amazon and today i actually noticed that uh, now a few uh book companies are reselling it as a second hand book as well which uh, i was wondering why the sales game went down but now people are <laughs> it's a secondary market now for this book so uh, yeah it's been around for 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 a couple of years and so, uh, another thing that uh, basically uh we offer as a as a as a additional resource for uh, helping uh, kind of people look for things in the auctions is uh, is our today auction workshop. So this is something we're planning to run on the 17th and 18th of February, and uh, like basically this webinar, this masterclass was uh, just we just under an hour now, but uh, normally uh, like we can take four hours. Like every Tuesday, I've got an auction bias club calls. We talk for about an hour and a half. We go for a lot of auction lots, and it's it's like what we do day in day out. And uh, so so this two day auction workshop is really something where we plan to uh, share way more knowledge and way more practical things because we're not kind of the kind of people who share theoretical. Uh, 
knowledge and 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 book stuff it's like we focus on producing results like we are interested in results and uh, and and actions and if uh, people around us take actions in auctions and take the correct actions in auctions they they produce massive profits and uh, and and also uh, the other way if you don't take correct auction correct actions in the auction environment you lose quite uh, quite a lot so that's why we put this workshop together and uh, it's not only the workshop it's uh, it's uh, it's it's basically a workshop uh, there's a couple of weeks of essential information group uh, subscription there is lots of templates there's lots of calculators there's a whatsapp group for uh, people who are within the workshop and that's that's what makes uh, things kind of exciting is uh, actually other people who are also looking at auctions because even though it might be your competitors but at the same time auctions are all about timing not everyone will be looking all the time at auctions and if you know what to look out for and you keep that consistency going uh then uh you, you find properties you do deals so uh the three of us are going to be running this workshop we're going to have uh, five more guest speakers traders auction professionals planning consultants um, the kind of people that you need around you uh to basically refer to on a daily basis when you look at an auction so this is something we're running uh, uh on the 17th 18th of february this is pretty much everything you're getting from it. I mean, it's like, it, it hurts my head to even look at it. It's that much stuff. Uh, there's lots of templates, lots of uh, kind of uh, interesting documents like London Auctioneer Dossier, which is basically our take on London auctioneers and what to expect from each of them. Because every auctioneer is different. Every auctioneer has got the different kind of uh, angle on getting clients they may be serving different clients and uh, kind of knowing those things puts you in a massively advantageous position comparing to 99 percent of the people in the market so um yes and, and the and the and the through and the follow-up coaching and uh, accountability just, calls forgot like about that. Yeah. there you go that's mm -hmm. yeah so so basically what we thought about is this workshop is two days great you get a lot of knowledge you get a headache from all the knowledge you get but then it's all about using that knowledge and uh, uh, in order to basically keep people accountable and also keep supporting people we also with everyone who's on the workshop we're going to be running like free one hour follow-up group coaching calls where we're going to be like answering questions we're going to be doing the same thing similar things as we're doing here but on a more sort of intimate uh, uh intimate environment because there's going to be uh, up to 30 people uh in that in that group so uh, it's going to be much more i would say intimate and uh, engaging um so this workshop is uh, 1949 and that's the regular price uh, you can, uh, as, a, as a kind of thank you for attending this uh, this webinar, we've got a coupon code WEBINAR500 that you can use for £500 off today. And uh, that's uh, that's basically to be entered on the checkout um, of, uh, of, 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 of uh, the page that Jay will introduce you to, which is this one. Okay, so we're, 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 we're just over the uh, hour mark. Uh, which is which is great. Uh, we're going to have a ton of questions to go through, and this is going to be very interactive. But um, for those of you who know one of us or just two of us, maybe it's going to be a great opportunity to connect with us. So you just uh, take a note of that um, hyperlink, um, and post. and Scott's uh, going to post that into the uh, YouTube channel. Uh, you click on that; it's going to give you uh, first and foremost the link uh, to check out in more detail the two-day workshop that we're going to be running it will give you a chance to order the book if you'd much rather just order the book nothing wrong with that the book's amazing um mm -hmm. and of course if you want to keep in touch with us keep connected seeing what we're up to uh we're not the types of people that go around posting pictures of oh we bought a property here's a set of keys uh we're doing we're, we're not those kind of people so what you are going to see is real stuff from us um we've been doing it for years we've been around for years so it makes all the sense in the world um to be a little bit of a pervert 
and just uh, follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Instagram for the kids. I'm terrible at Instagram, as everyone will see. Um, and there's also links to our YouTube channel, um, Omer's YouTube channel. And also on our YouTube channel, you'll see videos from uh, Property Sisters UK. Um, and, uh, we love them. We're big fans. And hopefully they're still big fans of us after that mention. <laughs> mm. um, so hopefully we've got a whole load of questions. Um, Piotr, how are you? Yeah, there's, there, there's quite a lot of questions. And uh, we're just going to take now uh, another probably 20 minutes, I think. Uh, minimum let's see how quickly we can tackle them and how much jay will digress and uh, uh <laughs> going to different avenues so uh, yes two seconds for, okay for uh, anyone that doesn't know jay has how many degrees do you have jay i forget I... <laughs> <laughs> Come on. okay um I've got uh, one. Um, how I have no idea how this is relevant, but they, they it is relevant like, because it's go, go on. Yeah, people like to take the mic. I've got three degrees. I started my oh. first degree at the age of eleven. Uh, that was uh, psychology. Then I did classics. Then I did law um, because I'm indecisive. <laughs> nice. Um, well, yeah. Yeah. What well, we've got? Uh, I, I, I am made for Trinity Finance from Mehmet and uh, yeah. Uh, Bushra saying the legal packs are fun, which is great. Agree, absolutely agree, Bushra. Uh, MB asked the question: uh, Where are where terms are negotiated before the auction? Is the negotiated term only available to that bidder? If another bidder wins who didn't negotiate, would they auto get the Section Forty Two notice rights? It depends on how switched on the seller and the seller solicitors are. So Piotr's got an example of a short lease property that he helped uh, a client buy in Thornton Heath. Uh, and he made an approach early with a with a, a direct offer. Uh, he Subsequently, they won it for less in the room, which was um, more full uh, of the seller. Um, but they had arranged the section 42 um, that if they won it, it would be served. Um, so yes, um, but there are some sellers that once you raise um something like that with them this list will go well i'll just draft something and stick it in the legal pack yeah so it's it's a bit of a 50 50 but if it's if you're dealing with someone who doesn't really know what they're doing as a seller and they're just kind of they're focusing on you as the person who's going to solve their problems then the chances are it's going to be pretty much negotiated just for you but there is a chance that if their solicitor is savvy and switched on then it'll be something that'll be made available to all and sundry and and quite a lot of the times uh it's um it's like like we said initially uh basically the sellers are the ones who set the terms of the sale so if you push uh, to negotiate the term uh, it, it's there for you but then the seller might also say okay well if i'm offering this to one person why not offer this to everyone and they actually change the legal park uh, change some terms in the legal park uh, and uh, and a lot of auctioneers as well like for example someone comes to us um, like we tell them how to best position their property and to best position for example a short lease flat like this is to say in the auction catalog straight away that you're willing to say uh, to serve the section 42 notice at the, the buyer's cost and if anyone asks you will do that and if you say that in the in the auction catalog uh, that basically gets more eyeballs on the property people are more at ease more confident so it's really about uh, whether you come to us to sell the property and whether you put switched on a uh, seller basically that's yeah. them uh, those are this is the short version of the answer um cool yes so Bushra is saying do as much due diligence before instructing solicitors uh basically because solicitor's time is uh very precious and expensive and also it's uh for solicitors reviewing legal parks is very risky because there's a time pressure there is also a massive risk that if something goes wrong and in auctions things might go wrong then uh that indemnity insurance will be uh basically we need to pay out and it will go up as a result of that so solicitors do not like to review legal parks uh as it's not their most favorite thing i mean they like reviewing it but it might not be their top priority thing and uh, because it's not as much money as everything else and also it's much more risk than everything else so yeah. 
they'll review a legal pack with the hope that you're going to win it so they can do the conveyance because that's really that's really where the value is um yeah oh we've got uh, a tv celebrity isn't kimberly me the the lady who did that is, that is the question that is yeah the i think so me, yes we've got we've got we've got tv royalty on with us hi kimberly <laughs> yes uh, we chatted about an auction property or the property that kimberly was uh, thinking of putting in the auction and uh, hopefully that's uh, progressing well kimberly keep us posted um okay alexa is asking what website is this uh, so i can't see my screen so small i'm gonna put this in the comments now eig property auctions.co.uk i think that's uh, the exact link if you type eig property auctions in google it will come up and yeah. i just posted in the comments so hopefully you can see that dun, dun, dun. okay all right jay a challenge for you tell about uh, the worst example of when you google the full address <laughs> I mean, we, we, I think we were in a, a clubhouse room. It must have been last year. And someone had asked the question, I've got horror stories. Um, there was the, the, the one time um, I Googled the address of the property. Actually, more recently, I went to view a property. I think it was in, um, oh, God, where is it? Hemel, Hemel Hempstead. And I went to view it. Uh, and nowhere on the, uh, the agent's particulars, this was to purchase from an estate agent to trade into auction. That was the strategy we were using for this. It was basically a large commercial property over ground and lower ground and step back. And then there was a large flat that could have been split into like six flats. It was unbelievable. Anyway, they didn't list into it that the property was listed. It was actually grade two listed. Um, so I only found that out because I Googled the full address of the property and the it came up with what elements of the building are listed, right? And, you know, I was sitting there thinking, okay, we'll, we'll title split, we'll do this, we'll put a win. All of that went out the window, right? What you can do with that property now is, is okay, not as limited. You can go for full planning and listed buildings, all of that rubbish. But th that would have added time, cost. It, it, it would have been disastrous. And it, if we didn't do that search, it basically we would have gone in a far higher price and costed ourselves out. So that was a really good one. The other one was I was buying a property in Leavesden, which is just outside of of Watford. And if anyone's a big Harry Potter fan, it's where the Harry Potter studios are. Um, and basically, I just Googled the address of the property. This is why I, religiously I do this. And basically, that property was um, subject to like a, a horrific honor killing. Some poor mm. girl was, um, I think, uh, no trigger warning, trigger warnings needed. I just a gruesome death in the bathroom at the hands of, I think, a brother, an uncle and a father or something like that. And that wasn't disclosed. And things like that can actually affect uh, mortgageability and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So um, mm -hmm. those are probably two of like the most extreme ones um, that you can come up with. Um, and if you don't know about them, um, you just fall into traps. And it's it's the easiest thing. Just Google the address. I promise you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That's, uh, yeah, we'll need a few minutes to recover from that story. But uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's... Uh, Apart from missing SD, what are other typical problems to look for that can be fixed? I think you don't really look for problems. The problem finds you, and then you just look for solutions. I uh, Basically, what I see a lot of the times is, uh, yeah, missing ASTs on properties like from receivers. And also, um, there was one property, for example, we're looking at was also from receivers. So receivers are notorious for, like, providing problem properties to auctions because they just don't have the information. They took over the property on behalf of the lender and then they just have to sell it, but they have no information. So sometimes the problems could be, like for example, access ways to the property. Maybe uh, there, there is nothing on the title plan that would stipulate there is a, an, an, an access way to the property, but then you may find that speaking with neighbors, you find that mm. this house always access the way the roads uh, uh, next to it and there is like a uh, basic you can get some form of such a declaration from someone uh, who owned this property and that way you can prove that there's a right of way so that's one of it rights of ways um uh, restrictive, covenants. restrictive covenants exactly 
Um, Enforcement what, notices that aren't disclosed because they didn't provide the local authority search. That's a juicy yeah. one. You see that uh, a lot. Subsidence, single skin properties. The, the list goes on and on, doesn't it? So, yeah. yeah. The, the thing mm -hmm. is, the, the problems are not, a property's not going to jump up and say, here's everything that's wrong with me, right? It's, it's kind of like it's not a Tinder app, right? It's, it's, here's all the positives, here's all the negatives. It doesn't happen. But you kind of have to. I, I don't i don't i'm married i don't use tinder <laughs> i just assume um but the the situation is you need to see i mean david sanderman the 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 guy from from essential information group the godfather of auctions the most important document in any legal pack is the one that isn't there because that will point out that will that will guide you into what's wrong instead of finding uh, you know, a bloody knife at a murder scene going, oh, that's a murder weapon, there'll be fingerprints and solving the crime. It's not as clear as that when you have to be a detective when it comes to options. Mm -hmm. You have to look for what isn't there. And then that what isn't there is the red flag that tells you what the problem may be. And it may not be that problem, but at least you're thinking in that way. Uh, and that can solve so many problems for you. That's right. Yes. Um, OK. And uh, Kimberly again. I get it speaking to local agents. I found one that uh, had visited the property I wanted to buy, was able to tell me there was a massive hole in the roof. Very Perfect good. for auction. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, Helen, again, this is gold dust. As a due diligence geek, it's the next level. It was says why you're being told what you're being told, not just to accept info at face value. Thanks, mm -hmm. Helen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, always question the motiv motives of the people that you're speaking to. Yeah. Um, brilliant. There's some question box, computer generated images that was answered. And uh, Animal asked a question. Um, you've shown examples that you have worked out in terms of profit. You also have examples where things didn't go your way. On these master classes, it's always the positives are that are only mentioned. Good. Um, I mean, if you want to learn I, how to lose money, I'd speak to somebody yeah. else. We, yeah, we haven't <laughs> run the auction, guys. I'm losing money. But, no, but that, that is a really good point. It is a good because, point. Because as traders, okay, um, some of the big traders, especially some that we know with, there's, there's um, a chap in, in particular I'm thinking about who trades probably about 50 properties a month um, spread across a couple of the London auction houses. And I, I, I speak to him and he tells me that um, there are wins and there are losses, but the wins outweigh the losses. And because he has a velocity and volume of trade, he can accept the losses. Um, now, the three of us are sharing wins, and that's because to date, I don't think there have been a, a loss because we've been particularly careful and the due diligence has been next level. And even when I trade a property, I, I run it past JMP, and then a week later, I run it past them again and, and triple check and triple check. In, and they've probably fed up with me so many times the amount that we run through stuff. But but ultimately, you, you may make a loss. And auction trading is is yeah. is a risky strategy. So what we're not trying to do is get everyone here to start auction trading, but it's opening your yeah, eyes it's, to... Um, yeah, exactly. And it's, 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 it's about taking calculated risks. So there are properties that we know when we're buying them, we think that probably we're not going to lose money but at the same time like if things go well we're not going to lose money and if things go badly we always look at the thing what, what's the worst case scenario mm -hmm. and sometimes the worst case scenario is that you're going to lose 10 15k or maybe 50k but then if it's only in like a one percent chance that this is going to happen and you try to mitigate everything that this one percent is not going to happen then mm -hmm. It's probably fine. So we haven't lost money uh, to date yet on a property. There's been a few properties where things went terribly wrong. Uh, yeah. There was one which uh, I purchased with a JV partner in, uh, in I think, September 2015. And that was in the auction. We exchanged contract with four weeks completion. And we thought we were buying a vacant property because that's what's said in the special conditions, even though the catalog entry was different. But then the seller didn't expect to get vacant possession, and he argued that it was his solicitors that made the uh, the made the uh, error in many made an error in the special conditions. So basically, we had to fight for approximately nine eight months and uh, to get vacant possession of this property. And the seller was uh, what do you call it? 
uh, threatening to basically forfeit our deposit and uh, we, are, we were at the risk of having to litigate and spend more money for this whole thing. But basically things work out well. So what that means is we agreed to pay 10K more for the property for uh, the fact, for the kind of uh, vacant possession. Um, and we had to just wait until that vacant possession was available. But once it was available, it was actually 2015. So the prices were going up. So it actually benefited us uh, uh, to to an extent. We bought this property in total for 290 with the extra 10, 10K. And we spent about 50K in total for finance and everything else. We sold it for 400 and. 3,000 pounds. So we made over 50K profit, but there was a lot of headache and there was a lot of uh, sleepless nights. Yeah. And yeah. especially that was my first, uh, one of the first kind of proper big, bigger trades with, uh, with joint venture partners. So it wasn't, it wasn't pretty, but it still made money. So. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we can, I mean, one of the things that helps us massively is uh, if there's something that can go wrong at auction, I've seen it. I've, you know, in the time that I was working for Auction House London, you see people losing the money. You see sellers making silly mistakes and you see buyers getting overly involved, emotionally mm -hmm. attached and overpaying. And, you know, I would see that a hundred and something properties seven mm -hmm. or eight times a year for almost seven years. Um, the short lease is the worst, isn't it? You see yeah. the buyer who doesn't read the legal pack and doesn't realize it's a 22 year lease and pays pays the, the open market value for a flat and then and then they they realize that they've got to pay 150 grand for a lease extension and you know yeah. it's actually better to just forfeit your deposit and walk away because of the loss that you would take so um that's, you know you need to be um really careful don't you and and mm. yeah that's right yeah. yeah so um yeah the horror stories uh are probably yet to come <laughs> Yeah, well, good question, Anmol. Cool. Next question from George Arnold. Planning approval in six weeks is very fast. So roughly, how much do you spend on application? Should I take everybody? this? Because I think I think it's in reference to Clinton, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So with the Clinton trade, one of the things that we do when we trade is um, we, we submitted a planning application. That, that doesn't mean the planning was approved. Someone bought that property on the basis that there was a pending planning application. They could see the plans. They could see the determination date. But you are right, George. Planning, uh, you'll be lucky if you even get your planning application validated in six weeks, let alone having an approval. And we've got planning applications that have been four, five, six months, and we still don't have approval on them. So, um, and how much did you spend on planning consultancy? Um, off the top of my head, I think we spent on this particular uh, transaction. In total, wasn't we didn't actually use a planning consultant; we just used an architect because it was a very simple scheme. It wasn't, you know, multiple units. So, is it just over a grand or something like that we spent? Um, and then the CGI, a couple of hundred quid, I think it was. But there were examples of of similar extensions, uh, mm. not just on that road, but like neighbouring roads. People have oh, already done the that. Precedent so was set. The, the precedent was set, and we basically just it was it just following the motions of what others have done. So, mm. um, yeah, brilliant. Okay, um, another one for you, Omar. Was Clinton? Omar? No, Kimberley uh, Clinton Avenue was brought to me via an estate agent, so it actually went on to Bright Move. Anyone could have bought that property. Um, it, it was it was to do with speed and positioning and securing it under our own you know skill set if you like. And the the beauty of that deal is that normally we're looking at buying a, a certain discount to market value, but I mean the value of it was about what three six five three seventy. So mm -hmm. we paid marginally below what you'd consider the market value of that asset to be. But the way that we unlocked the value was knowing that other properties had done this straight across extension. No mm. two story front and, and wrap around, etc. Uh, mm. And we just kind of we knew that's how we were going to squeeze that extra 30, 40 grand out of, out of what we were doing. And the real magic of that deal was structuring the um, exchange delayed completion back to back, which meant like like Homer had said earlier, you may have missed it, Kimberly. Um, but, um, you know, like Homer had said, we got the stamp, stamp duty substell tax relief, which meant there was no stamp. Um, there are a lot of moving parts to that. So it's it's not, uh, I'm just going to do this now. 
Like you have to manage the seller, you have to manage the agent, you have to manage the auctioneer. <laughs> like it's, oh, God, it's yeah. an orchestra, and mm. like one wrong note, and it could fall. And it almost did on, on one at mm. one point. It almost yeah. fell on its ass. But mm. you know, just we all pulled together and just like, okay, this is how we're going to approach it. You talk to that person. This is what we need to do. This is how you need to say it. Blah blah blah, and resolved it. Um, and maybe that goes back to what Anmol had 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 asked for. You know, there were complications with. Um, Park Avenue Muse, and we didn't gloss over it because the result was the result. But there were certain things with one or two of the tenants that we found out after the fact that could have scarpered the whole thing, could have meant that we wouldn't have got the the permitted um, development um, angle. But you, you kind of it's the the trick to auctions is when these things come up, you deal with them. Most people go into fright mm. mode. They think, okay, I need to cut my losses. I need to get out of this. I wasn't expecting that. And they, they sell it and maybe they make a loss. Maybe they make a gain. But we don't do that. We solve the problem. We unlock the value, therefore adding the value. And then we trade. And we're not volume traders. So when Omar had mentioned the chap that does 50 deals a month, he can he can lose on five or six of those. I went to an auction. It was an Allsop auction in 2016 i bumped into a couple of traders that i knew uh, and i was talking to them and they pointed oh so and so's over there i said oh how's he doing and they went oh we, we spoke to him half an hour ago he was down on six and up on 30 but he had put like 60 70 lots into that auction and and mm. almost gambling to a certain extent we're not those people <laughs> um yeah but you know we we're we, we take a little bit more time we approach things a little bit more intelligently and we make the most of the opportunities that we take um, and up until now, that hasn't lost us anything, but we are prepared for the day when it does, because we'll learn so much more from it. Yeah. Cool. Next question. For those that don't know, what are the charges for the underwriter service and how soon prior to the auction should the vendor speak to the underwriter? Oh, I, ho I hope this is a kill because we do love a bit of a kill. He's a good guy. Yeah. Um, so a kill, uh, if you're underwriting a property, all the same charges apply. If you're buying something pre-auction to if you're buying something post-auction and, it, and it's actually like um the question isn't very precise because i don't think you mean the van so so basically it's Are you talking about a service that we provide because it says service there is it to do with the terms as in you want to underwrite it at a 40 40 40 10 yeah. split or, or sorry, 40 40 20 split or it might be yeah so I, I think it's 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 really like underwrite is a very commercial agreement. It's like it could mm. be anything uh, to to anyone. The usual way is that uh, there's no real, like extra charges for it, but there is a split between uh, the seller, the buyer, and the auction house. So the auction house doesn't uh, get the basically uh, uh, the fees out of it. They get the fees for selling the property, and underwrite it kind of guarantees the sale. Um, but also um, uh, the auction houses get the uh, portion of the underwriting profit. So if it sells for more than the underwriting price, uh, the, the auction houses usually get like up to 20% of the price uh, to, to, to basically uh, ensure that they are actively making sure that the property sells for as much money as possible because it's in everyone's interest. So um, basically, there's no extra charges to 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 anyone, um, and uh, it's up to the vendor whether they want to accept that kind of almost like an insurance, or uh, because uh, like in the examples that we've given you, uh, like the, the person from auction buyers club offered four hundred eighty thousand, even though the guide price was three seven five, and probably the reserve was around four twenty five or four hundred. Or maybe three seven five because like some auction houses have the same reserve as as, as as everything else. So there was a chance he could have bought this property for less than his underwriting price. But once you commit to an underwrite, that's it. You're buying it for that, yeah. or you're making money. So um, there is a risk for everyone. There is a risk for uh, buyer and the seller. Uh, but then at the same time, uh, the vendor gets a guaranteed sale plus potential for an uplift, and the buyer gets a guaranteed profit or guaranteed property that's the that's the i mean not guaranteed profit but either buys the property or gets the profit uh so those are the two things and how early you should uh, speak to the uh, uh speak to the auctioneer so you will normally speak with an auctioneer 
uh, usually vendors don't get involved in it. And if you try to speak to the vendor, you will probably mess it up because explaining an underwrite is an art in itself and trying to sell an underwrite to the vendor, it takes some skill because vendors are normally quite um, reserved and uh, like, what do you say? Like they're quite cautious and uh, they they don't understand the process like uh, you are mostly in in property and maybe you haven't heard about underwrite before so imagine being a seller where you're selling an asset that's worth a lot of money to you uh, it needs to be explained properly uh, so you will be speaking with an auctioneer and uh, the best time probably to speak about an underwrite there isn't like a like a hard and fast rule but it's 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 a few days last week before the auction uh, yeah. because way before the auction uh you probably won't make an offer that seems attractive enough or if you make an offer that seems attractive enough it will go against you because that will just uh excite the seller too much and they won't do anything you need to make an offer when the seller is likely to accept it and the sellers are the most nervous even if they were super optimistic before they might be the most nervous like in the last week last few days of the auction so that's where they're the most likely to say yes to something uh, that uh, uh, yeah you offer that's the that's the answer to that one hopefully that helps um cool all right well i think we've gone through the questions that's not too bad and uh, uh, 30 minutes for answering questions so guys like uh, uh like we said we could we could be going for like uh until midnight or like that's why we kind of uh, created this workshop to basically uh make sure that people have uh, uh access to all this information and and also we don't have to rush through it because I think every question that was asked, we could go into way, way, way more details on what might be happening and how things might be happening. So um, that's that's what we're going to do in the, on the two-day workshop. And uh, you can connect with us. Uh, we also do a lot of Sunday lives. We do Sunday morning lives uh, uh, with uh, Helen Choli, Ross Harper, Adam Lawrence on LinkedIn Live, Facebook Live. So just go to this uh, page. Um, bit.ly uh, slash hammer connect and uh, you will get all the links to connect with omar jay myself and so uh, you'll get the links to the workshop and the book as well so that's it for today thank you so much for listening yeah it's been lovely time with you. yes uh, yeah and i'm wishing you lots of deals in this uh, in this new year Cool. Thanks, guys. Speak to you Cheers, soon. everyone. Thank you. See you later.